Some of you have heard me teach on this statistic before. The psychologists tell us that we have about 70,000 thoughts per day. I remember the first time I heard that, I thought, are you kidding me? I, you have that many thoughts? Every single day, it's just, just constant. Now, of course, it's a little easier. We know statistically and research has shown us that Bears fans have about 500 a day. It's like, so we know that it's a lot less. So if you're a Bears fan, don't be surprised by it. It's like, oh yeah, that makes sense, right? But for the rest of us, 70,000 thoughts a day, and 80% of them are negative. Did you know that? We have a massive amount of thoughts going through our mind every single day, and almost all of them, 80%, are negative. Now that really shocked me too. Because we're not aware of how much we're thinking, and then we're not aware of how much negative stuff we're putting in our mind every single day. And of course it's affecting our lives. I mean, that is affecting, that, that is the reason why some of you feel stuck in your career right now. That's the reason why some of you, in a romantic relationship, it's not going the way you want it to go. That's the reason why some of you, God seems distant to you. And this whole spiritual life stuff doesn't seem to matter much. It's not because God isn't real, it's not because he's a personal God, it's because of what you are thinking about God right now that is holding you back from experiencing the life that God wants you to have. Your thoughts are affecting everything, and successful people in life know this. They're, they're much more careful about what they think. For instance, uh, this woman's name is Maria Sharapova. She is one of the top female tennis players in the world today. This is her hoisting the French Open trophy um, after she won in 2014. Unfortunately, she was... She developed a shoulder problem. She had a serious shoulder injury, and it, it took her out of tennis, I think, for about a year. And she had to do all this rehabilitation to get back just to be able to play again. And the first tournament she was able to play in after she was recovered from this shoulder injury, uh, somebody asked her, did you ever think about giving up? And I loved her answer. She said, that, she said, I never had any interest in stopping. She said, I always felt like I had a lot better things in me. Now, do you think, if you thought every day, I've got a lot better things in me, that that would drive some kind of behavior and attitude inside of you? Sure would, wouldn't it? One of the books that I have told all of my kids is required reading, and I've given, I think all of them have at least one copy of this book, is Dale Carnegie's classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Many of you have read this. If you haven't read it, I think it's just one of the most important books about life and relationships to read. Dale Carnegie said this. He said, the biggest lesson I've learned is the stupendous importance of what we think. If I knew what you think, I would know what you are, for your thoughts make you what you are, and by changing our thoughts, we change our lives. Do you understand that? Do you understand that's true? If we could know what you were thinking, it would explain your behavior. And if we could change your thinking, it would change your behavior, it could change your life by doing this. So the reality is, many of you, isn't this true? Many of you know this about yourself. Many of you are far, far kinder to other people than you are to yourself. Many of you are far kinder to other people than you are to yourself. Some of you, as you sit here today, you're about to become aware for the first time of how much neg negativity you have in your mind. Some of you did not realize how much negative stuff was going on in your mind today. Some of you knew it was going on, you didn't know how much it was impacting you, and some of you knew it was going on, knew it was impacting you, you just didn't know what to do with it. How do you stop this constant negative stream that lives inside of us? And so, such an important subject. We started a series a couple weeks ago called Adventures in Kindness. And I said at the beginning of the series, this is my verse for the whole series. This is what I want. Colossians says, God, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with kindness. And the imagery is that when God, I, I, this is what I want, and I said this at the beginning, I want when people think about me, the first thing, one of the words that they just use to describe me is kind. I want my kids to say that dad is a kind dad. I want my grandkids to say that grandpa is a kind grandpa. And I want my coworkers to say that about me. And I want my friends to say that about me. I even want my enemies to say that about me. But that was last week's sermon, so I'm not doing that one again. Right? So clothe yourself with kindness. And there's no way to do that if you don't learn how to be kind to yourself. Because if you're beating yourself up, you cannot be as kind to others uh, while you're still 
beating yourself up. You've got to learn how to clothe yourself with kindness and be kind to yourself. So that is our very important subject today. Would you please open up your program, take out the notes you'll find inside, grab a pen. There'll be some things you're going to want to write down as we continue our series. Welcome to those of you who are watching on YouTube. So glad you joined us. And in the description below are these notes. You want to open them up and follow along. And of course, welcome to those of you who are watching on our website at penulechurch.life. Glad that you're tuned in too. Let's talk about this. So first, Understand the importance of self-talk. This is where it all begins. You gotta understand why this is such an important subject. Do not underestimate what we're talking about here today because it's affecting your life. Now, I like to read a lot of blogs and I like to read a lot of books about uh, counseling and psychological things. I find it fascinating, I love the subject. And I'm on some blogs and one of the things that they're talking a lot about is the issue of self-compassion. It's the same idea of kindness. Learn how to be compassionate to yourself. Learn how to be kind to yourself. A lot being written about this. And the research shows that what will happen is if you can learn how to be a little kinder to yourself, it'll lead to greater life satisfaction, higher emotional intelligence, better connection with others, uh, more happiness, more optimism. And it will also reduce things like depression, anxiety, fear of failure, perfectionism. It will take these things down and give you more of what you want. But the challenge is it's really hard to do. To really be kind to yourself like you want and need to be kind to yourself, that's a challenge. There was a woman who knew that she had a real problem with this, and so she went to a counselor. And she, the counselor gave her an assignment. One of the assignments she gave her was to write a letter to herself about all the things she really liked about herself. So it was basically a love letter to herself. Now, if, if we were to give that assignment to you, some of you would not want to do it. Some of you think it's stupid. Some of you would struggle to write much of anything at all. You, if, I, if we gave you the assignment of writing a letter about you, to yourself about all the things you don't like, well, you could fill that one, right? But how about compassion and kindness? And so she tried. She sat down. Here's what she said happened. She said, one day I sat down to write that lo love letter to myself. She said, the blank page stared at me, and suddenly I felt incapable of writing anything, much less a love letter. And then this thought popped into my mind. Of course you can't finish the challenge. You never finish anything. <laughs> She's trying to write a compassionate letter to herself, and she writes a, a nasty letter to herself. Isn't that crazy? Then she said this, she, and this is so significant. She said, the World, words swirled through my head, familiar and abrasive. Listen to that. The words swirled through my head, familiar and abrasive. The voice in our heads either propel us forward or they cripple us with fear and doubt. Did you know that? The words in your head are either driving your behavior forward and making your life better or they are crippling you. Take a look at this verse. For thousands of years, God has been saying, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Let's talk about a couple of the things that you've got to be careful of. First is self-criticism. You've really got to be careful about this one. Where you become your own worst critic. Some of you really, you really relate to this verse from Job. Job said this, he said, everything I say seems to condemn me. Ever had a feeling like that in your mind? It's like, oh, so much negativity and criticism. <laughs> Some of you don't need anyone else to attack you in your life because you attack yourself so much that you've, you've got that covered. Now, the two times when I see this most in my life and in the life of others is what do you say to yourself when you fail or forget something or make a mistake? What goes on in your head when you do that? Or what goes on in your, in your head when you have an opportunity to take a risk of some kind or move forward or some kind? Maybe it's ask that girl out or that guy out, or maybe it's apply for this open job that might be really good for you. What goes in your head in that moment? That's where the inner critic often comes out, and the inner critic can be brutal, right? The inner critic often says to us things like, oh, you can't do anything right, especially when you fail, right? You, make, you forget something, you forget an important appointment, and all of a sudden you're just internally beating yourself up. You'll never get better. You'll never figure this out. You're way too stupid to try that. I knew you are going to fail. You know that they're just going to say no to you. You know they won't want you, and the inner critic is merciless. Some of you, this is what goes on every day. And again, it, what's so crazy about this is our inner critic can be destructively critical even when we're successful. There was a woman who was a published author and she wasn't just 
she wasn't just, she hadn't just published a book. Her book had been very successful. She sold lots and lots of copies. She won two literary awards for her book. Okay, you're good if you can do that. First off, you get it published, you're good. Second, if someone buys it, you're really good. And then third, if you win awards for writing a book, you're really good. And so a friend was talking to her about her next book and she was really reluctant to write it. Here's what she said. She said, it was just a fluke. The next book will probably be a dud. You see, your inner critic can step up and start saying things like that even when you're winning. Some of you know exactly what that feels like. Because even when things are going good, there's that little voice in the back of your head that constantly says, it's just gonna, it's not gonna last. You're gonna screw it up some way. You're gonna mess this up somehow. And that inner critic just takes away our ability to move ahead with what God wants for our lives. So is this an issue for you? Self-criticism. Uh, I'm skipping letter B, sorry. We're gonna jump down to letter C, self-doubt. And it's obviously tied to the self-criticism. If you start criticizing yourself all the time, of course you're gonna doubt. Doubt will be the result of that. You'll never be successful, some of you think this. You're not good enough for that. You're just gonna fail anyway. You know you're just gonna blow it. You, you can't do something like this. The reality is some of you have decisions that you need to make right now. There are things you know you need to do. There are good things ahead of you, opportunities in front of you, and you will not pull the trigger because of this self-doubt that comes from that self-criticism. You criticize yourself so much that you doubt your ability to pull it off. And it's holding you back from again from the life that God wants you to have. It's keeping you stuck. There's a great, um, I've told the story of, Moses is one of my favorite characters in the Bible because he was just such a flawed human being like all of us and yet had incredible experiences with God. God appears to him in a burning bush that will not burn up, speaks to him from the bush. God Almighty tells Moses, you're my man, you're going back to Egypt, you're going to tell, stand in front of Pharaoh and you're going to say, hey, God says let my people go. I'm going to give you the words to say. So, and then in the middle of this, there's so much self-doubt inside of Moses. He literally says this to God. He said, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither either in the past or since you've spoken to your servant, I am slow of speech and tongue. In other words, God, you are, you are just totally wrong about this. You, you got the wrong guy. You need to send someone else. If, the me, if, if you need a messenger, I'm not a messenger. I cannot do what you're telling me to do. That's self-doubt. Some of you, that sounds a lot like what goes on in your head on a daily basis. You feel prompted by God, you have opportunities in front of you, and the self-doubt just gets so loud and you start holding yourself back unnecessarily. It's a very common thing. Matter of fact, uh, I don't wrestle with, you know what, maybe I need to rethink this, because I didn't think that this was really a big deal for me, but I'm not immune from the 80%. I just may not pay as much attention to it the negative that goes on in my mind. But I certainly have examples in my life of times when I've beat myself up. For instance, some of you know that right now I'm back in college, so one of my biggest regrets in life was I'd never finished my degree. I got hired after my junior year and left and I never finished it and I've always wanted my degree. So earlier this year I made it one of my goals. I'm going to get back into school and I'm gonna finish my degree. And so I applied to four different colleges. I got accepted all online schools and I had to just choose and I found the one that had the best price and I thought like the best options. And, and so I made my decision and then I waited because you had to select your, your classes and make your payment and get started. And so I kept pushing that off and pushing it off. Matter of fact, I pushed it off until the last day you could make the decision. I pushed it off until the last evening you could make the decision. I pushed it off until the college called me on the last evening of the day you could make the decision. And they said, you're gonna do this? You gotta pick your classes today and you gotta pay your money today. And I was so scared to do it. I had so many fears inside of me. Because I knew the very first class I was gonna take was the class I feared the most, college math. 
college math. I knew it. I'm like, I, I'm going to try the hardest and get it out of the way. And I'm so scared. It's an online program. It's 10 weeks long. What if I can't figure out the online program? What if I can't handle the math? What if I have, I have to do online math without a teacher in the room saying, now, Brian, do this. It's like, how am I going to figure this out? I had so much doubt. I was so scared. And finally, talking to this young, you know, 20-year-old kid on the phone that night, I'm like, all right, sign me up for these two classes, math and this one. And here's my credit card information. And I was so scared to do it because of all the doubt. Now, the great story about that is I am now four days away from being done with college math for the rest of my life. Four days. Four days. And I have an A. And I hate math. <laughs> but the doubt almost kept me back. Some of you, the doubt is keeping you back from something God really wants you to say yes to. Say yes to this relationship. Say yes to moving forward. Say yes to going to see a counselor. Say yes to applying for that job. But the doubt is so strong in your mind, it's holding you back. The, the, the most dangerous of them all is this one. It's shame. Shame. This is, in my opinion, the most dangerous of them all. I love this definition. There's another counselor online that I follow. He said this, shame is the deep sense that you are unacceptable because of something you did or something done to you or something associated with you. You feel exposed and humiliated. Look at that opening sentence again. Shame is the deep sense that you are unacceptable. So there's a big difference between shame and feeling convicted about doing something wrong. When you feel bad about doing something wrong, uh, you, you're, you hear it in your language. You point to your behavior. You can make mistakes and talk about the behavior or the choices and say, oh, I made the wrong choice there. I did the wrong thing in that situation. Right? So that's behavior focused. That's appropriate. You should evaluate your decisions. The problem is when it changes and the pronouns change and instead of talking about the behavior, you talk about you and the I am shows up. It's no longer about your behavior. Now it's about you. It's not that you're just a flawed human being like all of us. It's not that you just make mistakes like all of us do. It's now that it's a sign of something deeper. And you go into the I am and you label yourself with an I am and you say, I am a failure. I am unlovable. Do you hear the difference between saying I did something wrong and I am wrong? Do you hear the difference? Shame is the I am. Shame messages are devastating when you begin to internalize shame messages. I mean, they just destroy everything God wants for you. You feel de depressed, despair, hopeless. You want to give up on things that are really important. And unfortunately, they can live underneath the craziness of our life for a long, long time. We're not even aware that we have them. I had no idea how much shame I had inside of me until after my divorce. After my divorce, uh, the, the, the main shame message of my life came out. Oh, by the way, here, this is really important. If you take that shame message, what so many of us do is we put it on God. Because we're ashamed of ourselves, we think God is ashamed of us. And we push these messages up to God. And we say, God doesn't love me. God is ashamed of me. Some of you, this is how you feel today. God's just waiting to take good things from me. Ever had that feeling in your life? Something's really going good. You're about to get the big raise, about to get the big promotion, and the first thought in your mind or the back of your mind is, I'm, it probably won't last anyway. That's rooted in a shame message. God isn't going to help me because I don't deserve it. He won't hear my prayers. This explains why some of you don't pray, why you don't pursue spiritual things. It's because these shame messages are underlying you know, what you actually believe. Like I said, my shame message came out uh, three and a half years ago in my divorce. In that time... I, I lost an awful lot. And one of the things that I lost, as some of you know, is I, I lost my, most of my family. My dad has never spoken to me again in three and a half years. It's my dad. He never even asked a question. Just never spoke to me again. And my brother hasn't spoke to, spoken to me in three and a half years. He acts like I'm dead. <laughs> in three and a half years. I, I heard the song, you know, I don't particularly enjoy the song, I'll Be Home for Christmas because I won't be. I'm not welcome there. My dad keeps my mom from having any contact with me. I haven't seen her in three and a half years. 
And so when you go through that much rejection and that much pain, it's easy to internalize a shame message. And the shame message that came out inside of me was something that had been there all along. I didn't know it. And that is that I am unlovable. Now you can love me, and I got lots of people that love me. I'm not saying that. But if you really got close to me, you wouldn't love me either. And that shame message was there all along. I didn't know it. But it came out in that time. And it's crippling to you. Some of you have shame messages. Maybe you're aware of them. Maybe you're not. But it's part of this negative stuff that we say to ourselves, and it is so destructive. Think about this. Let's say that after the service is over, you're really hungry, so you go to a restaurant. You're sitting in a booth, and all of a sudden, they see, you see this mom and this four-year-old son being seated at a table right next to you. And the mom's kind of dragging the boy along. She's clearly irritated by him. She pushes him roughly down into a chair, and you're just sitting there watching this whole thing. And she starts just berating the kid. Some of you have probably seen this in restaurants or places where this actually does, unfortunately, happen. She starts, she's just, you know, it's quiet and angry, and she's like, I told you to zip up your coat before you come here. You're so stupid. Why are you always fighting me? Just do what I tell you. And the poor kid puts his head down. And then when the waitress comes to take the order, he, t he doesn't know what he wants. And so when he finally orders and walks away, the mom lets him have it. It's like, I, you always order the same thing. Why do you do this every time? You are such a dumb kid. Just order the same thing. We all know what you're going to get. Why are you so stupid? I can't understand why you're so stupid. And then finally the food comes and they put the, the drinks down and he knocks his milk over on the table and the waitress goes to get a rag and the mom really lets him have, I can't take you any there. You are such a worthless boy. I can't believe you. I can't stand all the stupid things you do all the time. Now the question is, unfortunately this happens, right? This happens in our world. What's, what's that kid's future? Right, you all know. So you can grow up confident. You grew up healthy. Some of you grew up in environments like that. But here's the problem. 80% of your self-talk is negative. You spend your whole day, whether you're aware of it or not, saying things like that to yourself. Calling yourself names, labeling your behavior, labeling yourself. And just like all of us sitting there would know, that poor kid has... He's got a lot of pain ahead of him, right? You have the same thing, you're doing it to yourself, and you do it every day. So what's the solution to this? This is why I'm a, one of my favorite aspects of God, is that we can learn how to replace the negative, internal, critical voices we have inside with God's truth, because it's totally different. We can learn to replace all that negativity with God's truth. But if we learn how to listen to the kind voice of God in our lives, it'll change us. It'll really change us. Look at what the Bible says. Let God transform you into a new person by changing what? The way you think. Do you ever wonder, if you ever read the life of Jesus, his focus was on teaching people. He went from town to town to town to town. I remember when I was younger, I used to think when I was reading my Bible, it's like, why didn't he focus more on healing people? He should have gone everywhere and just healed everybody. Now he did heal where he went. But you know why he was trying, why he constantly was saying this? You've heard it said, but I'm telling you this. So you believe this, but this is what I want you to believe. You've, you've thought this, but this is what I want you to think. You know why? Because he knew that if he could change what they thought, he would change their lives. Because your life is shaped by your thinking. He was all about changing the way we think. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Now, we talk about this a lot. I've talked about this a lot because it's so important. And so this is how your, think, your thoughts get formed inside of you. There's the A, B, C, and the D, and E. The A is an activating factor. Something happens in your life, and a belief gets formed, and there's an emotional consequence. For instance, that boy growing up in that scenario, thinking, I'm stupid, I am worthless, I'll never get anything right. So he believes that message. It's going to have an emotional consequence on him, right? He's going to grow up depressed, anxious, scared. He's going to have all kinds of emotions. But the reality is, and what we know, is that you can dispute those negative thoughts and exchange them for something positive. You don't have to stop with A, B, and C. You can also do D and E and go on and dispute the negative that's in your mind and exchange it for something positive. So let me give an example. There is a great verse from 1 Thessalonians where Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. 
And they were having this problem because people were running around saying, so what, one of the things Jesus taught is that he is going to come again. We call it the second coming of Jesus. We don't know when it's going to happen. could happen any day. And people were so excited about Jesus coming back. And there were false teachers running around at the, the time that Paul wrote this letter telling people, you missed it. So look at what he said. He said to these Christians, he said, don't be so easily shaken or alarmed. Do you hear the motion of those two words? By those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. Don't believe them. Even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or a letter supposedly from us. So he says, don't you believe them. I want you to think the right way about this. And here's what he said. So here's the A, B, and C. So activating factor. People were running around saying, you missed the coming of Jesus. He already came and you missed it. Oh, man. And so there was a belief. We missed his coming. Oh, no. There was emotional consequence. Fear and anxiety. They were shaken and alarmed. And Paul wrote this letter to say, stop it. Don't. You can dispute it. Don't believe what they're telling you you will not miss that day. He is coming and you won't miss it. So this is what he was saying. It's like dispute the negative thought, exchange it for something positive. You don't have to have this in your mind. This is the other thing that I use all the time and I love this one. You see and hear something. You miss the day of the Lord. You tell yourself a story. I missed it, oh no. And how you feel is driven by the story you just told and then you act appropriately. This, is, this explains Every time you watch somebody go through a trauma and they rise above it and somebody else goes through that same trauma and they were crushed by it, same trauma, different outcome in the people's lives has nothing to do with what you're going through, everything to do with what goes through your head. It's all about the story you tell when you go through that. If you tell the right story, it will help you go through it with faith and hope and confidence so the only way to do that is this. So on your notes, three things. First, you've got to catch that negative when it comes in. I hope you understand that. You've got to catch the negative. If you have 80% negative in your mind, you've got to catch it. And the problem is, are you kidding me? 70,000? I mean, I should be able to do this math right now in my head standing here since I'm almost done with it. So 70,000 thoughts a day, 80% of them is like, yeah, whatever. So it's a lot of negative, right? It's a lot of negative. So how do you catch that much negative? Well, the reality is our thoughts are instant. I mean, they're just in there. You just immediately think things when you experience things. You don't, you don't stop and say, well, I'm wondering, what, what am I thinking about that? So I can't catch it at the thought level. So I've said for years, this is how you catch it. You pay attention to your emotions. Catch it at the emotional level. Because it's creating emotion inside of you. Pay attention to your emotions. How do you feel today? How do you feel about your marriage? What emotion do you feel about? How do you feel about, how do you feel about your finances? How do you feel about your spiritual life? How do you feel about God? Catch it at the emotional level. Pay attention to your emotions because then you can go back and think about, you know, my emotions are coming from what I believe. And you can back up and say, well, what is it that I believe about my marriage? What is it I believe about my finances or about my future, about my career? And figure out the story that you're telling. For instance, when I was thinking about college, right? Think about signing up and think, delaying signing up, delaying signing up. I was afraid. So I needed to back up and say, what story am I telling myself? Well, the story I'm telling myself is that it's going to be really, 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 really hard to do. And maybe you can't do it. And maybe you're going to do a cl math class and you won't understand Venn diagrams. And then you're not going to pass. And then you'll have wasted money. And then you'll have, you know, I mean, all these bad stories. They were creating the emotion, determining my behavior. So I can't catch it at the, at the thought level. I catch it at the emotion level. Pay attention to your emotions. How do you feel? Because your feelings will tell you when you've got to back up and think about your what's, what your beliefs are. You're telling yourself a story. It's creating the feeling. So once you pay attention to your feelings, back up and say, what story am I telling myself? Because that will help you figure out step two. Because now you've got to challenge it. Now you've got to challenge it. For some of you, this may be the most important thing I'm going to say today. The little tagline under there is, is what I want you to hear. The inner critic is not the real you. On one of those counselor blogs that I follow, uh, there's a woman. Her name is Dr. Sharon Martin. And she was talking about all of this self-criticism, all this negative stuff we do to ourselves. And she said this, it's all learned. 
self-blame, self-criticism, they're learned behaviors. You got it from a blaming or, cr or a critical parent. That's where you got that. Or a teacher or a friend or a family member. But somebody is the source of your inner critic. And then she went on to say this, listen to this. Our negative beliefs can also result from what was said or what wasn't said or done to us as kids. If your parents weren't attentive to your feelings, the unspoken message was your feelings and you don't matter. Some of you, that was the home you were raised in. Your feelings and you don't matter. And then she said this, we also tend to choose life partners who repeat that very same cycle of blame and criticism because we're used to it and it validates, that validates the negative beliefs that we already have about ourselves. You ever wonder why some people just choose bad relationship after bad relationship after bad relationship? We already have that underlying belief that we don't deserve anything better anyway. So we look for people who are going to do to us what we already believe about ourselves and repeat that pattern over and over again. So my question is, whose voice have you internalized? For some of you, you know, it's one of your parents, highly critical. It was someone that you loved or trusted, highly critical. And you've internalized this negative stuff inside of you. Here's what I want you to know. God doesn't want that for you. That's not the real you. God says, I want you to fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. I want you to think about things that are excellent, worthy of praise. There's no place in the Bible where he says this, fix your thoughts on what is harsh and cruel. Make yourself think about all the condemning and judgmental thoughts. Think about things that are destructive to you and make you feel awful. He never says that. He doesn't want that in your head. And really, so we, we, we catch it. We pay attention to our emotions. Okay, I know I'm doing some, I got a wrong belief in my mind because I feel terrible. I feel scared, I feel anxious, I feel worried, I feel something. And so we challenge, it's not the real me, that's not me. You were never created that way by God, to have that much negativity in your mind. And now you gotta do this one, and the most important thing is you gotta listen to another voice. You have to put another voice in your head and the voice that I'm telling you to put in your head is, the, is God's because his kindness will help you tell a different story. This is what I want you to know. His kindness will help you tell a different story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of this woman. When Jesus was here on earth 2,000 years ago doing all these miracles, there was a woman in Israel who had a bleeding disorder. And she had been to doctor after doctor and nobody could heal her. Now the problem with that is 2,000 years ago in Israel, if you were bleeding like that, you were ceremonially and religiously unclean. You couldn't go to church. You couldn't participate in the religious services. You were isolated. You lived alone. Not only that, religious people couldn't even be around you because if they touched you, then they were ceremonially unclean. So this poor woman was isolated from everyone, suffering alone, and into that world comes Jesus 2,000 years ago. And she hears his teachings and she hears about his miracles and she hears what he's doing and she's so amazed that she puts a thought in her mind and she says this, look at this. She said to herself, if I only can touch his cloak, I'll be healed. That's all I need. And so she goes to where Jesus is, breaking religious law. First off, she's a woman, and in those days, 2,000 years ago, religious men didn't talk to women. On top of that, they sure didn't touch women. On top of that, she was bleeding. And she fights her way through the crowd. She gets to the edge of Jesus. She touches his cloak. And in that moment, power came out from Jesus and heals her in response to her faith. And it's this beautiful story of faith. And it's one of my favorite stories. But the key phrase in that verse right there is this. She said to herself, you have to start telling yourself better stories. The stories that you're telling are either building your faith or destroying it. So she said to herself, if only I can get to Jesus because his kindness and his power will be enough for me. And she said to herself, and because of this, she was healed. She told the right story. It determined how she felt. She felt hope and it determined her actions. Here's what I want you to know. The kindness of God is the basis for living a confident life and a loving life and a faith-filled life. So three and a half years ago, 
It's so interesting. You know, people, people around me get divorced. It happens in our world. And so many times, you know, where I work, people get divorced and they come to work the next day and it's not a big subject of talk conversation and nobody really talks about it and we just move on. You don't get that same experience when you're the pastor of a church in a small town. Not, not the same experience. The things that were said to me and done to me in the middle of that divorce were, I'm already heartbroken and devastated and now I'm a single dad with two kids and I'm solely responsible for them and then all this other stuff. The things that were said about me were horrific. I used to keep a note, somewhere I have a note, a page filled with all the rumors that I was hearing about myself and it became a little funny but not funny. You know, I was gay, I had multiple lovers. I mean, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head but it was a long list. It was just endless. It was like anything people wanted to say, they could say, and people believed it. And nobody asked, few people asked what actually happened. And it was just devastating to me. So much cruelty. I, and then in the middle of, like I've already told you, I lose my dad, I lose my family, I lose my brother, I lose, you know, so many friends. Just never talk to me again. Can't stand me. I can't tell you how many disgusted looks I've seen in the last three and a half years. It's just endless. This much cruelty, just so overwhelming. And it's, those are the situations you have to watch out for because what happens is you internalize their voices. It's no coincidence that in the middle of that that I had that big encounter with shame that, see, I am unlovable. That's no coincidence. But people who know me now, like my kids who know me now, see the dad before and the dad after, they talk about how happy I am, how healthy I am. I mean, maybe healthier than I've ever been in my entire life. And there is one reason for that. One. It is the unbelievable kindness of God. In the middle of all that pain and all that suffering, I depended on the kindness of God through my Bible. I've said it over and over again. When you're in pain, there's one book you go to in the Bible. The book of Psalms right in the middle. The biggest book right in the middle. Every morning I would sit down with my Bible and I would open up to Psalms and I would start reading until God showed me his kindness and it was almost every single day. I filled journals with things that God was saying in the middle of that. Instead of listening to all the cruelty out there that was so easy to internalize, I listened to what God had to say to me and here's one of the things that he said. Psalm 33, 4. The word of the Lord holds true and we can trust Everything he does. Do you have a problem with that verse? Anyone else have a problem with that verse? First time I read that verse, I grab my notebook and you know, whenever something strikes you in the Bible, you write about it. You're supposed to you know, write about it. God's trying to say something. So I grab my notebook. Here's my actual comments. I wrote down, I said, wow, this is a challenge, isn't it? How easy is it for me to trust everything he does in my life? Do you trust everything he does? Or am I the only one that struggles with that phrase? Everything he does? I immediately started in my journal writing down all the reasons why I don't trust him. And I only got through four. Immediately wrote down four. And then in, in, in a moment, a thought popped into my head. And I realized this. Do you remember, if you know the story of the Exodus, God does bring... Mo uses Moses to bring the nation of Israel out of slavery on, and they're on their way to a, a land that is going to be amazing. They're, God's going to take care of them. If you've read that story, you know what they're like on the way. Every single problem that comes up, they're like, oh, God's going to kill us. See, this is just proof. God hates us. God wants to destroy us. Everything. They literally have a pillar of fire guiding them at night. Now, that's unusual, right? Oh, look, a pillar of fire. We can follow it at night. And look, a pillar of cloud during the day. Well, that's kind of evidence of God, don't you think? And every time they're thirsty, Moses hits a rock and water comes out. Or every time they're, they're hungry, birds fall down and they get to eat them. And there's food every morning when they wake up. And there's not, not like there's no evidence of God in their lives at all, right? But immediately, any problem, their very first thing is because they have this underlying shame message, God hates me. God just wants to kill me. The moment a problem comes up, they go right back and they're like, see, see look, we're, we, we're not water right now. God's going to kill us. That's what he did. He brought us out here in Egypt to kill us. It's like, what the heck? 
And immediately I realized, oh, I I'm doing what they do. God says this, we can trust everything he does, and my first list I start making is why I don't trust God list. The first thing. My first response to that is negative. And I start writing a list of why I can't trust God. And this all pops into my mind just almost instantaneously. I only wrote four things down on that list, and then I caught myself, I realized what I was doing, and I thought, you know what, I can write a, a different list, can't I? I can write that list, can't I? And I immediately changed. And I immediately began a list of why, the reasons I have to trust in my God. And I started filling it, and I started filling it with some amazing things. You know, when I needed a job, God gave me a job that I still have to this day that I love, that's opening up all kinds of opportunities for me. It just was such an incredible God thing. And then right at that time when I needed a place to stay, four families open, open, said, hey, come live with us. You can bring your daughters, come live with us. And we had four people open up their homes for us to stay in while we didn't know where we were gonna go. And then my realtor friend in town tells me there's this amazing deal on this house and I buy this little house that I get to flip that I love. And then in the middle of that, I have no reliable vehicle and a friend of mine who's, who doesn't have anything gives me his car. And it was an incredible gift. And then on and on and on I go with this list. And the list gets longer. And as the list gets longer, longer and I'm focused on the kindness of God, my story changes. My story changes. And all of a sudden I realize, you know what, I, I can trust him. With everything he does, even when I don't understand it in the moment, I know that my God will be kind. And by focusing on the kindness of God, it, cha it changed the story. And once the story changed, the feelings changed. And once the feelings changed, then I could be healthier. I could do things that I am capable of doing. It's all rooted in the kindness of God. His kindness changes my story. Some of you, my, the homework assignment is to go home and write yourself a letter to yourself. Write yourself a love letter. Do you know the Bible actually says you're supposed to love others as you love yourself? How fully do you think you can love others if you don't even love yourself? Some of you do not want to do that. Some of you couldn't write a paragraph. If that's you, then acknowledge today you got a big problem with this subject right here. Acknowledge it. Become aware today that you are holding your life back because of these inter the voices of external critics that you've internalized. And you've got an issue. And it may be counseling. I go to counseling almost every week for seven months now. And I have no plans to stop. I need help to sort through all of this mess these messages. Some of you, you need it too. You need to get with the right person who can help you get free from those voices from your past. And one of the things to do is, I, I just can't emphasize this enough. I, as you can tell, this is so meaningful to me. Grab a Bible. If you don't have one, we'll give you one. Read in the book of Psalms. Let God speak to you. Let him show you his kindness. He will, sh he will show you just how much he loves you. Let me have you all fit, bow your heads as we finish today. you're just exploring your faith with us here today, I cannot begin to describe for you how much God loves you. The Bible says this, and these are critical words, he loves you with an unfailing love. Did you know that? Unfailing. There has never been a moment of your life where he's not loved you. The worst moment of your life, the thing that you were ashamed of that you want, don't want anyone to know about, he saw you in that moment and still loved you. You have never stopped him and you never will stop him. He loves you with an unfailing love, and the proof of his love for you is what he did by sending his son 2,000 years ago to die. Jesus came to earth to die on a cross to pay for what we've done that's wrong so that we could be completely forgiven. All my mistakes, all your mistakes, paid for in full by Jesus on a cross, and if you'll let him, Jesus will forgive you, and he will pour his love and kindness into you and it just requires a step of faith. If you want his gift of forgiveness, 
and eternal life, say something like this to him. Say, Jesus, I'm turning to you today. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I've heard that you died on the cross to pay for what I've done, and I need that. Please come and make your home inside of me. In Jesus' name, amen.